Greetings. In this video, we take a look at the Redmine mechanism called Wiki. If the word Wiki sounds familiar to you, it's no accident. This engine is used on many platforms, including the well-known site Wikipedia. In this course, we will use this mechanism and the section in the project management system to document the project. In this case, the emphasis should be on technical documentation, but it will not be superfluous to describe and other useful information that may be useful in the framework of a specific project. First of all, let us study the basic mechanisms that we will use in this section. These mechanisms are creating wiki links. In order to create such a link, it's enough to write a word in double square brackets in the page editor. After we've created a test link, let's click on it to see what we got. As you may have noticed, following the link we created didn't take us to the content page, but to the editor instead. In fact, this is quite obvious, because we didn't create any content, just marked the existence of the page by creating a link. At the top of the page, before the editor, we can see the page header in our case, the text of the link we created. In the editor is the same text marked with the H1 tag, the first level header. Now, we can create some content on the page using the capabilities of our editor. The built-in editor contains standard controls, and I will not dwell on them in detail because it is quite a standard tool, which is a simplified analog of Microsoft Word or something similar. For the test, I created some text, a list, and a formula. Similarly, you can add images, tables, normal links, and so on. Speaking of ordinary links, I'll give you a little demonstration, though. In order to create such a link, we need to select the part of the text that should become a link and click on the Create Link icon in the Editor panel. In the window that appears, just enter the address of the external link and click OK. That's all. The link is created. If you want to edit an existing link, you can simply click on it twice. Note the ability to control the parent page property. If you need to, you can select any existing page as the parent page for the current page. This can be useful if you are trying to structure pages according to their semantics. By default, the parent page is the one you came from when you created the page. After we have saved our changes, we can see the result. As you can see, the link we created works fine. Let's now go back to the previous page. We need to learn how to create synonym links. To do this in the editor, create another link but after the text that will identify the page we are creating, we will add a vertical line and write an alternative text for the link without spaces. As you can notice, we have two links with different text, but the new link is blue instead of red, which means the page for that link already exists. Clicking the new link will take us to the page we just created. This information should be enough to deal with the technical aspect of filling out documentation in wiki page format. However, the most difficult part of this task is the actual filling of such pages with content, or rather the task of determining what kind of content should be written in the wiki. To avoid wasting time and creating blank pages to demonstrate a possible approach, I will simply create a list suggesting a typical structure for a standard app development project, be it a mobile app or a website. Don't be afraid to deviate from the suggested framework. It's only given to you to offer some kind of starting point for your imagination. As I like to say, the ideal documentation described in this section should allow someone who is not immersed in your project to quickly understand what the project is, how it is structured from a technical perspective, and how to get involved in development. Again, this is an ideal situation, and it would be extremely problematic if not impossible to achieve. So, our task is just to try to get as close to this ideal as you can, so, any standard project contains functional and non-functional requirements, and they are definitely worth fixing in the documentation before you get down to programming your application. By functional requirements, we mean what the user can do in your application. In short, the functions of the application that the user uses. Authorization, for example, is a function. But the fact that authorization is implemented through a Google account is a function specification and would be considered a non-functional requirement, since it doesn't add a new function, but sets restrictions on the implementation. Non-functional requirements include programming languages, frameworks, server operating system, databases, design requirements, integration, and so on. 
That is, these are things that do not directly relate to the description of the user's capabilities. To describe functional requirements, it is useful to use use case scenarios, tables that describe how a particular action is performed and how the system reacts to it. As an example, we will explore such a functionality as authorization. To do this, let's create a table with two columns, user actions and system reactions. In such a table, first of all, we should describe a typical successful scenario, that is, the course of events, which for us, as a developer, will be considered the most typical among successful ones. In the left column, we will write the user's actions, and in the right column, we will write the reaction of the system. Keep in mind, for every user action, there must be a reaction from the system, and the system can perform several actions in a row if necessary. Going back to our documentation structure, let's think about what else we can describe. It will be important to explain what kind of tools we use in development. For example, if you are developing front-end application using jQuery and Bootstrap, it is worth explaining what they are and how they are usually used. For demonstration purposes, it is sufficient to specify several excerpts from the code, explaining how it works, where and when it should be used. And of course, you should not neglect the links to reference materials on the specified tool. When designing and developing your application, it is worth capturing graphical artifacts as well, for example, in UML. It will definitely be useful to capture the domain model as a class diagram, the use case scenarios as an activity diagram, the implementation class diagram of your application that takes into account the development tools you choose, sequence diagrams that can be used to demonstrate how your use cases have been implemented in code. For each of the diagrams or images, you should add text descriptions that will reveal the meaning of what is depicted. This is just an example of the basic pages you can create in your documentation. Other pages may be more specific to your project, so add any pages you find useful for an outsider to understand your project. Also, it's helpful to add pages like known problems and solutions and useful literature. Let's look at a couple of examples of my students' work from past years. Keep in mind, these papers did not score maximum marks, but it will be helpful to examine your colleagues' approach to documentation. It is good practice to cross-reference all pages of your documentation. Every time you mention an entity that is described on another page, you should make a link to the page where that entity is described. Using the Structure Grouped View mode, we can see only a few pages that the author has created. Alas they are quite few and poorly correspond to the recommended template I described earlier. Each page, however, is decorated decently overall, lots of both external and internal links, and the text is generally rather useful. If you stop at the page with idea IDE description, there is obviously an unnecessary element, a table comparing two versions of the software. However, the process of installing and configuring the software can really be considered useful. Exactly the same can be said about the page dedicated to Scoop, except there's nothing superfluous, but there is a useful configuration guide. Overall, you can see that all pages are somehow dedicated to configuring and installing components or software, but there are no adequate examples of how to use the libraries, which is obviously a disadvantage. Also, missing are diagrams or charts, as well as scripts and other pages that I recommended to describe. Since we definitely lack examples of more successful pages, I suggest looking at another student's work. However, to my great regret, it is in Russian, which will definitely make it difficult for you to understand. Nevertheless, I don't think this will be much of a problem, since we look more at how these pages are designed than we do at the text itself. The design elements are presented in parts with a detailed description of the content under each image including the rules for the behavior of the elements on the page, as well as mentioning related entities in the form of links. The page devoted to Bootstrap includes a description of the framework itself, as well as ways to connect it and examples of its use in a project. Each block of code cited represents some kind of interface element created using Bootstrap. Links to external self-tutorials and reference books are used to describe CSS3. Figma, Font Awesome, and Google Fonts are described very briefly, mostly with a focus on how these tools can be used in a project. HTML5 as CCS3 is described with references to external sources. 
In doing so, the references are broken up into groups by meaning, for easy reading and understanding. However, the page devoted to JavaScript is quite lengthy. This page uses the same approach to describing the material as the Bootstrap page does, showing examples of how the language can be used to solve specific problems. This page includes snippets of code to demonstrate how to send network requests, how to change the headers of outgoing requests, the concept of promise, and how they are commonly used. It also gives an example of using JSON, callback functions, the ternary conditional statement, arrow functions, and other useful examples. You could also see the structure of the project in terms of JS files, style files, and view files. Among the pages under consideration are also pages describing UML design and development artifacts. The first such artifact is the use case list diagram, which depicts the actors who interact with the system and the use cases themselves, ovals, each representing some feature for the actor, whether the user or another system. It is important to note that on this page, in addition to the image, there is also text that describes exactly what is depicted in the image. In the same way, the pages devoted to the problem domain model, represented in the form of a UML class diagram, are designed. At the same time, the author has decided to demonstrate the individual elements of the model on separate pages in order to elaborate on the data model used to store information. By the way, this work still received the maximum points for the work with Wiki, so it makes sense to be guided by it. In general, this is all I wanted to tell about this section of the project management system Redmine, and I hope that the provided information will be enough to work with a specified section in the course on Introduction to Software Engineering.